Like you have to be determined. Intelligence and, and education can only take you so far. Think hard about, do you really believe in what you're doing, right? And if you really believe that your mission is, just get it done. Hello, 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 and a little bit of bonjour as well. I'm super excited because I have the Tufik Bubez here today. But Tufik, before we start, let me line this up with a great introduction. Tufik Bubez is a serial entrepreneur with three successful exits to his name. He was the founding CTO of Saffron Technology with a mission of building cognitive computing systems for big data, which was acquired by Intel, Metaphor Software, where he developed next generation machine learning analytics and anomaly detection for IT ops and security that was acquired by Splunk, and Layer 7 Technologies, one of the most successful vendors of the API management SOA governance and security spaces that was acquired by the Computer Associates, CA, as we say in the business. Prior, Tufik was the chief architect for SOA at IBM's software group and the chief architect for IBM's web services tools. He holds a BSc and master's of electrical engineering degrees from McGill and a PhD of biomedical engineering from Rutgers. Tufik is currently the CTO and CPO at Macro Health, helping to create intelligent healthcare markets. Tufik, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris. I've listened to your podcast before, and I am just so excited and thrilled to be here. Oh my gosh, you're going to see me blush. Those those listening to the podcast won't see me blush, but those who see it here, they, they know I am blushing. Well, you know what? Let's, let's start with where you are currently at uh, Macro Health. Tell me about your current role at Macro Health, please. Yeah, so I'm uh, the CTO and the Chief Product Officer at Macro Health. Uh, so I run both, as you can imagine, the CTO, the engineering, architecture, the technology part of, of, the, of the company. And then as a CPO, I run anything to do with product management, PMO, and all that kind of stuff. So anything to do with building product, uh, it's kind of my role. And of course, as you know, uh, I always think of being an executive is also part of driving the culture of the company. So I feel that part of my role, part of the role of any senior executive or anybody for that matter, the company is help drive a good, healthy uh, culture in the company. So that's kind of my role uh, at Macro Health. Cool. And can you tell me what Macro Health does for those who don't, who aren't uh, aware? Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, for, in order to do that, I will probably have to step back and talk a little bit about the U.S. healthcare system. So Macro Health um, actually helps uh, drive down the cost of healthcare in the US. And that has repercussions over everybody of millions of people uh, mm -hmm. in the US. As you know, healthcare costs in the US are, are huge and escalating. They were, they're over $4 trillion, like with a T uh, oh, yeah. this year and, and growing, right? So, and, and the way it works in the US is, is relatively complex. There are, I would say, three major uh, roles or, or, or categories of players in, in that ecosystem. It's not a single payer, as we have seen in Canada and some mm -hmm. other countries. It is an actual competitive marketplace. So you have what millions of what we call providers. These are uh, hospitals, clinics, you know, doctors, and so on. And these are providers that provide healthcare services. And then you have you know, thousands of payers, as opposed to having a single payer like we have. You have insurance companies, you have governments, state level, local. You have companies who uh, take on the, the the responsibilities themselves. They, you know, if you have if you're a large company, you want to take. So these are the pairs, but they don't really talk directly to each other. There's like a middle layer in between them that kind of gates all the claims. It all works on claims. So you go to a hospital, God forbid, you know, generate a claim. That claim, like hundred thousand dollars, goes to your insurance company to whoever's paying that claim. They send it through a whole bunch of different. Um, uh, checks and balances and so on. And it goes through some kind of this middle layer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that middle layer actually will look at that claim and say, oh, it's this you know, hospital in Hawaii. We have some kind of agreement with the hospital in Hawaii, volume-based, so we, you get a discount. So your insurance mm -hmm. company pays a lower rate. So we are actually, all that is done right now with like, you know, uh, string and sealing wax and scotch tape and Excel mm -hmm. spreadsheets, right? And, mm -hmm. and people doing email and faxing stuff, right? What we're building at Matter Health is actually a, a cloud-based modern marketplace for all that stuff to happen so that mm -hmm. you know you can send your claims one way and there's a whole bunch of machine learning and intelligence into that marketplace that decides where that claim could go, what kind of optimization, and so on. So we're reducing significantly the cost of healthcare that way and it has impact on people's lives. I mean, you know, one of our one of our 
for recent customers, you know, they they lowered what happens is that they lowered the cost of healthcare, the lower cost of insurance, which means people, employees in that company, for example, pay a lot less for the healthcare. You know, so it has impact everywhere, but it's uh, it's really really cool technology. So other than the, tech, the the impact on people's lives, it's a really cool technology, interesting technology, right? Sorry, long long long. No, uh, that's fantastic. But it's a really complex system. Y- once you know get what? Into it. If we need a long explanation to, to improve people's health care and health outcomes from health care and, and also making sure that those who are sick have money left in their pocketbooks, especially for our exactly. American cousins, exactly. Um, exactly. I think that's wonderful. I mean, one of our clients uh, personally is actually the American Medical Association. I know that's yeah. one of their missions and we do some projects around that. But I also understand from what you're saying, you know, it's a, it's a marketplace and you know, there's the payers and then there's the, the hospitals, but there's also the insurance in between. And if you could be that layer of knowledge in between and then, you know, kind of remove the friction, uh, that is what costs are. Um, exactly. that sounds like an excellent mission. Well, you know, you're talking about layers. You, you, you said it a lot less uh, <laughs> words than I did. <laughs> you, you're a pro. Uh, you know what? I just blah, blah. I just blah, blah. That's all I do. But I really, really respect and, and appreciate your mission. And I, and I, I think there's huge Thank upside. You. And again, if you can make these things frictionless, right, you capture the, yes. the, 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 exactly. the, everyone wins. That's the, that's exactly. the thing that people exactly. understand. Exactly everyone right. wins by making it more efficient. You're capturing, um, you know, a big share of the market yourself too, which is, which is, which is awesome. Absolutely. Well, we're talking about layers, uh, you know, and yes. I had to look up, you know, the second I saw Layer seven. Okay, it's got to be an OSI thing. Like, it, you know, I went back to my computer engineering way oh, back in the old, you. you know, graphs to see. Yeah, no, that's the last layer. I actually debated that there were eight layers, which shows, wow, it's been twenty five years since there. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I had lots of friends working at uh, Layer Seven, and I know the company really, really well. Um, so wow. tell me, what's the creation story of Layer Seven? Ah, so um, the this is a long story another long story that's so perfect we got in. time <laughs> you know. i got my team uh, <laughs> okay good so again i you know you can tell i'm an engineer right you can tell mm-hmm. them, you know i i like to set things up properly before i jump into it so in order to talk about layer seven and the seven layers of the osi stack as you correctly pointed out which we can talk a little bit later about you know i need to step back and talk about you know kind of make sure we talk about the concept of service or architecture and uh, I don't know how, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the concept. And, and I don't mean that in any disrespectful way. No, no, no. But, you know, and at least in general, if we go back to the early 2000s, um, there was a move away from building software in these l- relatively large chunks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have the concept of an application that was relatively um, monolithic, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you, uh, any, re- any component that was needed to build that application was part of that code part of that application in order and it was built there in order for that application to run so -hmm. now we started moving towards the concept of breaking down these applications into much much smaller pieces of functionality that live independently they're built independently they're updated independently and they're accessible um on on uh they're reusable accessible over the network for example if you're running an app that needed i don't know the temperature at a Mm -hmm. particular location right you used to build it as part of your uh monolithic application but now mm-hmm. you just build a temperature service somewhere else and everybody can use it you just send like a an http request to it mm-hmm. and you get it back so that's kind of the world that we started moving to in the early 2000s that's the concept of service oriented architecture mm-hmm. right and by the way today there's a concept of microservices right You've, everybody mm-hmm. talks of microservices yeah. So that's where it comes from, right? Is the concept of building things as, as, as services. Now, it sounds like, of course, well, of course, why don't we do that? But 20 years ago, that wasn't the case, right? So uh, so in the early days, I was convinced that's how the world was going to, to go. Mm-hmm. And, but there was no infrastructure to support that kind of model, right? And somebody needed to build uh, that kind of infrastructure. So I was, at the time, I was still in the U.S. So I was living in the U.S. at the time. I did my PhD in the U.S. and did my first startup stuff in the U.S. And um, I wanted to kind of move away into uh, that kind of building infrastructure for service and architecture and how people build service and architecture. Uh, and I'm Canadian. And, you know, this is going to sound a little bit, I hope it doesn't sound insulting to my U.S. cousins. And uh, so my first, my eldest daughter was born in the U.S. And I kind of wanted her to go up in Canada. Uh, so I, we, I, we decided, I decided I wanted to move back and then I started a company in Vancouver, 
so I moved to Vancouver and then through a, a whole bunch of different connections through my sister in Montreal, my family's in Montreal and BDC and so on. Uh, I got introduced to Dimitri Sorota uh, th who also had a, had a company in Seattle and wanted to, was in the well, same stage of life that I was and wanted to move up to Vancouver. And so we talked, we got introduced, we talked a lot and uh, we decided to start a company. We met Lon and Wilmar Wong and Klein. So there's, and Jamie Glennon. So like the four of us kind of started this company. I moved to Vancouver, Dimitri moved to Vancouver uh, and uh, we started, we started actually um, in a little closet. I don't know if you remember Make Technologies mm -hmm. uh, in Yaletown. So, and uh, they, they kind of lent us little tiny little closet with a phone line and that's how we started in Yaletown. Yeah. That's amazing. And what, and what year was that? Uh, 2002. 2002. So this is, this is not an overnight success, people. This is a company that you build. Yeah. You build and yeah. build and build. Built, built, yeah. Built to, you know, a really great exit. I think uh, uh, it was, you know, it was an awesome exit for everybody involved. Like, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. business in BC or BC business, I think, called it the largest tech exit um, in, in a decade, right? You know, it, so it was a really it was big significant. Exit. I remember, was, and and it brought a great company like CA. I know I know a couple of their executives, and they're right, fantastic. Right. Like I, I know them out of the mm -hmm. valley, and and when when you know we got to discuss this things that they were actually really excited about you know penetrating deeper into 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 Vancouver Absolutely. and Absolutely. what you can help them with. Um, Absolutely, and I think the repercussions are are multiple on that. Like obviously, a lot of the people you know, the founders, we did really well. The VCs did really, really well. All our VCs were very happy, which means more money to fund other Canadian companies. Exactly. Uh, you know, all, a lot of the employees did really well, you know, go, went on. Uh, and I, I believe, and, and maybe, you know, maybe self-aggrandizing, but I, I believe it also helped start this concept of like big companies coming to Vancouver and starting to build big teams in Vancouver, right? So... I'm, I'm I'm a homer when it comes to Vancouver. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's and it's wonder and it's wonderful. And I and I hundred percent agree. I mean, you look at like markets like in in Ontario or in you know Ottawa with with, with Shopify mm -hmm. and all that, and you have you know some liquidity events. And yeah. what that builds for the communities is 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 like a ten x for what that builds just for the founders half the time, especially because like yourself, you don't probably need to work if you don't want to, maybe. Uh, but at the end of the day. You got to learn. You've learned a lot, and it's a bug, oh, yeah. right? Like it's a virus. You want to continue oh, absolutely. creating. I, I, exactly. I want to say I need to work because I, you know, people ask me, "What are you going to do when you retire?" I'm like work. <laughs> <laughs> I give my wife the same answer. She yeah. hates it. She hates it. But <laughs> right? there's there's too yeah. many problems in the world to solve, right? And there's you know what? What this allows you to do is do a little more risk and work on big problems like the like what you're doing yeah. in the states. Exactly. So. Exactly. That's exactly, that's exactly. fantastic. Well, you know, well, let's talk a little bit more. I mean, um, you know, you, you've come back up to Canada with with uh, with Layer Seven, but what about Metaphor Software? Can you can you share the uh, the creation yeah, story of that of for course. me, please? Yeah, no, of course. Uh, so as you know, talks about started talks about Layer Seven getting acquired, and we start talking to companies about acquisitions and so on. Uh, the reality is, uh, I didn't want to be part of like a big company and like be no disrespect again that's not me right <laughs> um I, I and i had a whole bunch of ideas that i wanted to 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 look at so i, I i'm a very hands-on cto right so i was always traveling with my salespeople, talking to our customers going into their data centers and so on and then i started seeing early on kind of the move uh, we're talking about 2008 2009 the move from like large data centers to the cloud mm -hmm. and all the pain that it that it brought like that, that that brought into it. You have these security and operations people in these big data centers that are overwhelmed by the amount of data that they're getting, by the amount of alerts. We had a name for it, it was called uh, alert fatigue. You know, <laughs> you're looking at your screen, you come in and you're like it's scrolling with alerts because you've got like Docker and this and that and you're going up and down all that kind of stuff and you don't know what's real anymore. So what happens is you tend to ignore it. So uh, and people lose their jobs, companies tank. There's so many examples on campus because they ignored the various alerts, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but the monitoring systems that were in place at the time were very old school. They were like rule-based, they were mm -hmm. threshold-based, there was no intelligence in them at all. So they mm -hmm. couldn't detect anything, right? So, uh, so I was having ideas about like, how do you build, with my background in machine learning and, and intelligent systems, like how do you build intelligence into this, mm -hmm. but in real time streaming, right? The model, which is the model. So 
So that's kind of what I wanted to do. So I left and I started Metaphor with actually uh, Jenny Yang from BDC, who also mm -hmm. left BDC to, because she used to joke that, you know, she was on the other side of the VC uh, table. She mm -hmm. wanted to get her hands in actually operationally and build a company. And, uh, and Jenny and I were good friends. We're very good friends. Um, and so we decided to start the company together. And we, uh, yeah, and that's kind of where it led to. We started again in Vancouver, built it up uh, to be this kind of prime uh, machine learning platform for streaming real-time analytics, security operations, that kind of stuff. Cool. And, and, and can you tell me a little bit about the exit of that company then? Yeah. So um, we, we, wanted, we wanted a partnership with Splunk. So Splunk is the premier, premier company in log analytics, right? Mm -hmm. So every, everybody I talked to was using Splunk in those days to do, look at their log um, and at their logs, right? But what they didn't have, they didn't have a, an intelligence platform, machine learning platform, and they didn't have real streaming analytics. It was mm -hmm. all search index based, right? So we decided to partner with them. So we went to talk to Splunk and I went down to San Francisco, presented, uh, we got introduced to our VCs to them in San Francisco, went down, talked to them a little bit um, and uh, they liked what we had. They put us through our, like a whole bunch of big costs and they sent us data and we performed really well. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we want to participate. We were looking at our next round. Uh, mm -hmm. They said, we want to come in as a strategic um, on your round. We said, fine. Uh, so they started looking through it, and then some all of a sudden started like, actually, no, we're going to acquire the company. <laughs> so the okay. exit was really, really good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so one of the things here, again, being a, a homer for Vancouver, one of, the, one of the things that I was really adamant about is that uh, they leave the team in Vancouver, right? Fantastic. And they start building. So Splunk, that was, they had never done that before because they were only San Francisco based in terms of uh, tech. They had some operations in, you know, in Plano, Texas, and a couple other places, but all their tech was in San Francisco at the time. Um, and they said, okay. Um, and it was great. So we went from like 20 people when, when we got acquired to like, I think, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred people now mm -hmm. Splunk has in Vancouver built. Uh, so I built two offices for them. I built the Homer Street office. And then when we outgrew that office, we moved to 555 Robson. Mm -hmm. the old palace building yep. and they, we, we, they had two floors we built two floors for them there so it was a really good success story again everybody was happy multiple x's i don't want to say like 10 15 x for the vcs but again another like huge multiples for the VCs but that, involved. But, but that's awesome and you know what you did them a favor that being splunk not not the vcs here i'm sure you yeah. did a favor for them too but you did yeah, splunk oh, yeah. a favor by recognizing the opportunity of being here and yeah. um you know Absolutely. that's 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 a that's a real win especially when you have you know this many people working uh working for them and it's a, a great name too i mean obviously and a, a fun one to yeah. say um yeah, well know. you know what <laughs> we've got through two great companies let's go let's go for a third let's roll the dice then okay saffron technology <laughs> one of my favorite spices saffron technology oh, yeah. tell me about that yeah, saffron. Well, it's interesting. The name comes because, you know, it's, you know, but spice, it only takes a little bit to flavor a whole day. Oh, yeah. So we so we're like saffron only takes a little bit to uh, um, to, to, to to add a lot of intelligence to, um, to that. So uh, saffron was my first startup. I was still in the US at the time. I was at IBM. Great. Mm -hmm. I had a great time at IBM, uh, but I was very interested in machine learning due to my background. My PhD was in machine learning before it was a buzzword or it was cool, you know? <laughs> uh, and it was math and statistics at the time and, and some neurophysiology. So actually, uh, just as an aside, I had to pass like my oral exams, not just in engineering, but actually in neuroscience, which is, wow. you know, another story uh, in biomed. <laughs> but, you know, so I was living in the US, I had some friends at IBM who were, who were also interested in that whole machine learning concept and intelligence, intelligent agents at the time. Um, and one of my friends, Manny Aparicio, had good contacts into the intelligence community. Um, and, uh, and as it happens, kind of the intelligence community in those days was the only one that had big data before mm -hmm. big data was a thing and needed machine learning, quote unquote, before machine learning was a, was a thing mm -hmm. either, right? And so, and they had really interesting problems. So kind of Manny and, and Jim left, and then I left shortly after IBM and we started Saffron. And the goal was to build this kind of intelligent agent technology where um, you can actually amass huge quantities of data. Like we're talking huge quantities mm -hmm. of data. You can imagine what the NSA and all those guys 
have in terms of uh, data uh, and then sort through it and find like the nuggets, the needles in that haystack mm -hmm. through associations. So we had a whole bunch of patents around building associative memories and how you go through data and how you organize it and how you have like a learning intelligence uh, that, that can kind of build, pull out these kind of needles. Uh, That's out of fascinating. So, yeah, it was really cool. So for me, uh, you know, we had to start with the intelligence community, but that wasn't my goal. My goal was to get into genomics, right? Because mm -hmm. those days, genomics was a big deal and, yeah, yeah. and and huge amounts of data, right? And trying to find these combinations and these kind of like, uh, you know, genes that were maybe uh, indicator of some kind of, uh, you know, early on indicators of disease. Things like that. that was kind of the goal for me as I was building the technology, but it kind of never came to fruition um, and that's another story, right? But yeah, that's kind of what we were building. Really well, cool I dig stuff. it, I dig it. I mean, that's super cool. And what year What year was that? Just so I can get context 2000. around. Uh, 2000. To, I mean, 2000. So, I mean, the models the, yeah. then compared to now in, in, oh, in terms yeah. of what you can oh. do, um, oh night, and day, yeah, yeah. night and yeah, day, night and day. There was no SageMaker and there was, there was no, you know, uh, there was no Google to, like to build these things. It was, we had to build everything by hand. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's super cool. Well, what's, what's the difference in between building a company in the, in the States and building it in Canada? Well, I mean, saying in the States is kind of broad, depending on where it's at, but if you build a company in some of the like tech centers, like the Bay area versus New York versus Boston, even where I was in, uh, in RTB in North Carolina research triangle park, uh, you know, uh, what you get amongst, uh, foremost is, um, VC. Right, you get VC money, you get mm -hmm. VCs uh, experience, you get VCs who have built these like big, huge companies who are looking for the long term. Right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, again, I love, I have nothing but respect and gratitude for our Canadian VCs that supported us, whether it's GrowthWorks or BDC, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but there's not enough of them in Canada, I yeah. find, or in Vancouver for that matter. Completely. What you get in the US is that large amount, huge amounts of money, VCs that have been there, done that, that can actually look for the long-term and help you. The other thing obviously that you get is the market, a lot easier access to the market. Right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, but so, but on the other hand, the quality of tech, the quality of people, I don't see any, like when I was at Plunk, I ran a very large, two large organizations and I had people reporting to me in Vancouver, Seattle, uh, San Francisco, and San Jose, right? Mm -hmm. So I could see the spectrum of uh, quality and technical expertise. And frankly, I would put up good architects or good developers from Vancouver up against anybody. Like, so it was, it's not an issue that there's better technologists in the US. It's just a much bigger market, much, a lot more money, uh, more VCs, right? Yeah, and people comfortable with a lot more risk capital too. Like you know, they're they're exactly. willing willing to put the put the, roll the dice a little bit more. Um, Absolutely. You know, though, if you want to look at it from a graph, I do see. You know, we are catching up, which again comes from exits like like yourself and you know VCs winning and all that, and the pool getting bigger. Um, sure. So you know, it's yeah. it's only bigger. Well, you know, I I really this is kind of a a, a question I'm quite interested in, especially. I mean, you've had three exits. Um, you've you've you know been successful uh, with companies, but how do you define success for yourself? Like, in, and let me let me let me just preface that because you know you have the startup types, and this is the you know the people we're trying to trying to get the message through to is those at the beginning or yeah. somewhere in their journey where yeah. say, oh, if I only got the product to market, I'm successful. Or if I only got that first round of funding, I got it successful. Or, I mean, it's a graph, right? How do you yeah. consider yourself successful? Oh, that's a multi-layered oh, yeah. thing. Success. Oh, uh, so, so for me, success is a very personal thing. I'm happy. I'm healthy. My family is healthy. I have a good, you know, uh, social circle of social life. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with my job. My job has impact. And I'm financially comfortable. I don't want to deny the financial aspect of it. I mean, you, you wrap all that together to me on a personal level, that success. Um, there are anti-patterns of success too. I mean, you, you, people talk about like different metrics, you know, oh, look at all the money, look at the fame, you know, all the kind of stuff. But that is not quite true because you see very rich people who are very unhappy. You see very famous people who are very unhappy, you know. Uh, so, so to me, I don't know, this sounds maybe too new agey. I don't know. Uh, but for me, success is getting somewhere where you can look back, say like, I've made an impact. I'm in a place in my life where I'm happy. I'm comfortable. I'm healthy. 
I have the friends that I that I have and I have the family that I have and you know I I don't really want for anything you know that's wonderful um, that's that's to me and, and and I have to tell you I don't know like from a personal level and and I I grew up I you know so my parents were immigrants so we we immigrated to Montreal in the 70s and we left like I, I grew up in the civil war right so mm. my threshold is very very different than mm. most people on what happiness is what success is what security is right for sure so um so for me this these kind of things like family health you know comfort are very very important very good metrics of success i love that i love that that's you know it's it's not only is it hard to disagree with but it's something that i think people should be aiming for not just in their startup but in a more being around human beings mm-hmm. around it you know, in your which life, is, you know, which is, which is, which is great. Well, you know, one thing that I really, really, really appreciate is I, I shared, you know, some of the questions I thought we were going to talk about. Um, and you came back with, with, with something that you said was personally important to you. And I, and, and I'm, I'm saying it this way because I'm really glad this is personally important to you because I think it should be. Um, but what you wanted to talk about is some of the women in tech events that you sponsor oh, yes. or you're, 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 you're yes. it's very important to you. Why, why is, um, this important to you? Why, why is this, why is women in tech um, necessary to be yeah. supported? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'll tell you why it's not. But people think, well, I have three daughters, right? Think, okay. oh, you know, you have three daughters. So of course you're interested in advancing. I'm, I'm saying no, that's actually, I find it maybe a little bit even insulting sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. because you don't have to be a woman. You don't have to have daughters to be interested in, in equality, right? Nope. So, so I'll tell you why, why that's not the reason why. Um, because a lot of people that they jump to that conclusion right away. Uh, but you know, I was always, um, I always find it puzzling that, uh, the lack of women representation in engineering and the technical field was very puzzling to me always. I remember when I was at McGill in my, uh, engineering class, in my graduating mm-hmm. class, I think there was like maybe six or seven women out of like a hundred. It's a lot better now, yeah. Oh but, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but, but to me, that struck me at the time. I was like, what's going on? I, I didn't understand. Uh, and so, you know, uh, and same everywhere I went, like at IBM, the same kind of deal. I had a really, really good friend, Marianne Hondo, who was like one of the best security tech- technical people I've ever met with. I wrote a couple of papers with her and she was on my team when we were doing ser- uh, SOA, service and architecture, but she was like a, an anomaly at IBM, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, what's going on here? So when I finally got into a position where I actually make a concrete difference i decided to start doing something about it um you know as one for example so there's katrina reed one of the vps there she's an amazing amazing person i love her mm-hmm. to death uh so katrina and i sponsored started the program sponsored was called the women technology events um and and, and co-sponsored it at uh at splunk i i, I mean she was I, I was just in a support support role, but it was important for me to do that. And then, so when I since I was a site leader at Van, in Vancouver, so ran a couple of women tech events uh, here with the help of uh, the BCTIA. Right? Um, mm-hmm. So Camila Lozada and Bell Tam at the time who mm-hmm. were uh, running that, they were very very supportive and they gave us the space to run it and so on. So it was really really important for me. Uh, we sponsored something, um, a, a mentorship program at Splunk, where, you know, you could pair up, match up um, women technologists or anybody who wanted to be part of that program with senior leaders, senior executives in the company to help them kind of get, you know, get what they need, get the the, 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 the mentorship that, that you want. And, and for me, like, even from, if you want to look at it just as an accountant or as a CFO from a purely selfish perspective, it's like, you know, half the population is women, you know, Imagine how much better off we would be if we could get a lot more of them into the tech, even like on that purely selfish level, you know, mm-hmm. let alone mm-hmm. all the all the other aspects of it. So, you know, and now he, he, like at, at, at Macro Health, uh, we have a really, really good diversity and inclusion in the DIE program that good. Sahar Kanani, uh, who, who's, one, who's my head of PMO on, on my team, uh, actually uh, runs really, really well. So it's been... It's been it's been a constant theme in my career. As soon as I could kind of do something about it, 
Oh, no, I, and I think that's awesome. I really do. You know, I mean, the thing that really excites me is we sponsor a lot of um, UBC hackathons and to see yes. how much female representation is there now. I mean, it's right? it's a little more than 50, it feels like. And I think yes. back in my day at UBC, it was, you know, kind of like what you're saying, like, you know, yeah. 25 kind of a thing, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, the world's a better place. And I think it's because we're, you know, you're sponsoring events like this or you're sponsoring, you know, and supporting um, and nurturing um, because, you know, as you, as, as, as you touched on, you know, when you have diversity, you're, 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 you have better reflection of way to solve problems um, and, and better, stronger points of view, um, Absolutely. Totally. which, which, totally. which makes products better. And, uh, and, and, you know, actually I want to touch with it because this is rare that you are a CTO, especially with a big company, you know, that with smaller companies, when everyone's got 15 titles and you know, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. but you're a CTO and a CPO. So you've the technology and the product. Yeah. Why both? And how did they diverge from each other? So I learned uh, my lesson the hard way. <laughs> no, I've always, uh, because traditionally you see technology and engineering and product management at each other's throats, mm -hmm. you know? I want this, well, you can't have it. Well, it's important. Well, we don't have the resources, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I saw that several times in my early days in my career. And um, so when we did layer seven, uh, I was like, uh, we can't have that. So even from the layer seven days, I like, we can't have that. I need, we need to have engineering, technology, and product management feel like they're on the same team, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, um, you can say all you want, but reporting structure is kind of important, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have your management team, you have product managers and engineering leaders sitting on the same team, feeling part of the same team, um, you, you foster that kind of collaboration a lot, lot better and you build better products and you understand each other. So I've always been a strong believer. So it's inter the interesting thing is that when I went to Splunk, when we got acquired by Splunk, they didn't have that model, right? Really? Splunk, no, Splunk is very much, and most companies uh, I find are, you yeah. know, you've got your CTO, your engineering, and mm -hmm. you've got product management and that lives mm -hmm. in a different silo, right? Yeah. But, you know, I... Uh, I prevailed on them to, Very good. Very <laughs> to good. give me that model. So I had like product managers and engineering leaders reporting up to me into my org. And uh, I think we're all the better for it. It was a really, really new liability. So when I wanted to do macro health here, that was actually an important piece for me. Uh, so product management, uh, you asked me, so how did I differ? Product management is about kind of what's, what are the features of the product that are really important for our customers? Mm -hmm. And when do we need to get them out? And what's, you know, what's the market look like? All the kind of stuff. And th those are a lot of times at odds with you know, technical feasibility, technical mm -hmm. possibilities, resources, and timeline, right? On the engineering side. So when you have these two teams sitting separately, they're going to argue. Mm -hmm. And not in a good way. There's good mm -hmm. arguments, there's bad arguments, right? Mm -hmm. So having them be part of the same team kind of removes the bad arguments and only leaves the good kind of collaborative arguments, right? That's kind that's, of how they differ. I mean, that's, that, that honestly, that's super interesting because I mean, just like you said, I mean, you have the tech, the tech people who sometimes want to make tech for tech's sake, you know, it's, yeah. it's not a business, it's tech for tech's sake. And that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, these are the tinkerers in the world. And then you yeah. have the people that, you know, I would say, you know, more modern frameworks towards understanding a product, which is, hey, it's getting people's hands and have them tell us what the product should be. Well, you know, that might not work with the tinkerers sometimes. So getting oh. them, you know, getting them to work in, in synchro synchronicity, that's, that's, that's really cool. And maybe that's, maybe that's the model we need to be thinking about, uh, you know, uh, I, moving forward. I'm a big believer in that, big believer. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Well, you know what? It's a simple question for you, because I know when I was young, you know, my my grandmother had, uh, you know, the old IBMs and I got to actually it was a Tandy, pardon me, it was a, a Radio Shack computer. And that's what got me into this world. The Frost yeah, 80? TRS 80? TS, TS 180. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I got to do lemonade stand from a magazine. I'd love doing it. You know, uh, it was it was what what yeah. really got my bugs going. I in remember the world. The trash oh yeah, yeah. Used to call it. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it, 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 it worked awesome. okay. Oh, it was it, awesome. It, don't, don't get me wrong. I started on Commodore sixty four. So, you know, <laughs> I, I I had the Vic twenty too. So Vic the twenty. Oh my god! No 20. way. The the, yeah. the, the tape the player granddaddy. version. Of that, the there, you go. Of the there you go. Yeah. But, but but tell me then, what what got you? What spiked your interest in technology? Oh man! Uh, so it started at a young age, believe it or not. I mean, you probably hear it from a lot of the technologists you talk to, right? I I remember my parents showing me a picture 
of me as I have zero recollection of it, by the way. But there's a little black and white picture of me at, at two years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I had one of those pedal cars. You, know, yep. you get in the car and you push the pedal and the car moves. Yep. Apparently, I that car spent more time on its side, on its back, with me tinkering inside <laughs> of it than me sitting in it. I have Love pictures, that. little black and white pictures of me, like mm -hmm. with the car on its back and like me, my head poking inside, trying to figure out why is it, why does it move when I push the pedal, right? <laughs> And, you know, uh, and, and then, you know, sort of at, at the time, other kids in my class were doing like these baking soda volcanoes for science fair. You know, mm -hmm. I built a relatively complex Apollo 11, Saturn V and lunar exploration module for my science fair. You know, <laughs> I was, yeah, I was that kid. You know, <laughs> um, always interested in that kind of stuff uh, and technology and uh, I don't know, combination nature and nurture, uh, mm -hmm. both things. But eventually, I got introduced to computers, right? We were just talking about TRS-80 and the Commodore yeah, yeah. 64. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, that was, like, changed my world, you know? Uh, we were freaking at the time. Probably know what that means. Oh, freaking yeah. the phone system on, like, 110 baud, 300 yeah. baud modems. Probably, mm -hmm. I, I, a large portion of your listeners probably won't know that. But, but you know. Those kids. And, uh. <laughs> kids today, I know. But, you know, and that, my world changed then. And, and, I've, and I've been interested in that ever since then, you know. Sorry, I got, I got excited. Awesome you know, answer. No, I was hoping you'd get excited because this is, this is, this is what we're doing. This is why we do this. Um, well, you know right. what? Yeah. I mean, Miguel, I, I, I didn't go to Miguel. I was at UBC and actually Laval in Quebec City, yeah. you oh, know, sort yeah, of guy. Yeah. Yeah. But. I well, you're love... such a nice guy. How come? So I know. No, no, I dig that. I did. Though. That's why I transferred to UBC. Joking. I was too nice. Joking. But uh, anyhow. I, you know, had really good friends who were, you know, at McGill and every year I would go and visit them. And I loved that school, yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know, so doing an undergraduate, I mean, obviously an amazing school, but then you went to Rutgers. Why did, yeah, why did yeah. you decide to go to Rutgers to do a PhD? Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, so for me, I was at McGill for a long time, as you know, uh, did my undergrad and my master's, you know, my family's all in Montreal and, mm -hmm. you know, you go to McGill, that's the thing to do. Uh, and I started actually my PhD at McGill. I was very interested in in, um, in parallel processing, parallel computing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, frankly, really as a way to understand how the brain works. But I was not happy with the environment at the time. And I was talking to friends and they were saying, well, Tuf, you know, it's not really good for you to stay in the same environment like mm -hmm. the whole time. You need to go and change. And I somehow through serendipity, I got introduced to this I, I get goosebumps just thinking about him. <laughs> Jerome Letman. Jerome mm -hmm. Letman, who was one of the, oh, he was an incredible, incredible guy, incredible scientist. It's such an honor and privilege to have met him and worked with him. Uh, and Jerome Letman was interested in brain dynamics. And so was I. That was his research. He wrote one of the pioneering papers on kind of, you know, it's called, it's funny name. It's what the frog's eyes tell the frog's brain. Hmm. Famous paper. <laughs> really you know uh, like not like any formal you know scientific paper right mm -hmm. and i got introduced to him uh he was at mit i was in montreal it's an easy easy trip i can start to mit but then he got offered a position at rutgers and they gave him a big lab so he moved to rutgers and he said like why don't you move to rutgers with me and i did and rutgers was really good to me mm -hmm. uh, they gave me what's called an excellence fellowship like i got like they paid my room board tuitions they gave me Fantastic. a stipend it was like a no-brainer, right? Yeah. And I ended up working with uh, Dr. Letman, uh, who, again, is a high high point in my life, uh, working with, with such 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 an incredible scientist. But but there's a side to that story. So mm -hmm. I get to Rutgers, and I'm there for a couple of years, and uh, like I'm looking around to his other PhD students, and they've been there seven, eight, nine years. And still haven't finished. I'm like, you know what? Uh, maybe that's not for me. <laughs> so then I actually transferred out into another, into a, 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 a different program. I stayed in biomed, but I went more into like pure neural networks, it's kind of computing mathematics, uh, neural mm -hmm. networks program, which kind of the, the, you know, everybody knows more about deep learning, but deep learning comes from back propagation neural networks, yeah. right? And that was my my thesis. My dissertation was about on back propagation neural networks. Oh, that's super interesting. And I love the fact that you have that, you know, that that professor. I mean, we all have that one professor right, that we right? that, that 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 just inflicted us. Like, you know, God is so a excited. Story. I you know. totally I I you know, I thought that. I always thought that because I've yeah, I can't tell you how many people I talk to this, you know what? There's this either like in high school or university, there's this one person who yeah. 
same thing. Oh, uh, passed away unfortunately a few years uh, back. Uh, Drum Lettman, but he, he made he had a huge influence on my life on on my kind of the way I started thinking, looking at complex system processing. Oh, I love how these people can make a big difference. I mean, I don't want to get in just right. I had one prof like that. I actually did oh, my yeah, undergrad. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I had my undergrad. I did it in actually um, of history and Russian, uh, which is kind of a weird combination, I got to say. And I had one prof who was a retired diplomat from London and he had to be like 90 something, but he oh had, um, so he was an Oxford guy and he moved, you know, to that, but his father was a diplomat. His uncle was a diplomat. And he, he was the most like, just blew my mind, but he had met him. Hitler. he had met like all of these people you're just like oh tell God. me about it and what i loved yeah. about him was he made this the, what every student thinks is simple real like for example we're like okay um we need to talk about um or sorry a war breaks out in this country and you need to set in peacekeepers what do you do and everyone's like well you just set in peacekeepers it's like yeah that what? country won't allow it to go over <laughs> this won't do this this one ha you know actually supports it and you just go oh wow these decisions are so hard actually it's a lot you more know? complex than i thought yeah <laughs> But it made me excited about every class with him. And, you know, right. I, I'd have to yeah. say, I don't know if he's passed on, but he'd probably be 130 now. So I assume he oh probably, he yeah, probably yeah. has. But you yeah, know what? Yeah. I'm just, that's, I, that's... I, I just, I hope that you and I, I and that. anyone else here can be that spark in someone else's life too. Exactly. You know? I love that. I love that. You know, oh. uh, and, and for me, mentorship is a really important. Speaking Completely. of which, you know, I do a lot of, you know, uh, internships like I go you know and, and I go to the universities and we got interns like I always have interns working and I, you know mentorship is a really important part but sure. yeah I love that story yeah that's oh. funny well, this is this is the two uh, you know podcast, not the Chris one, so I won't I won't go too deep <laughs> no, into that no. again. But Look, but you, you know what? It. I'm 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 intrigued by you know I, I believe this was at your time at at IBM. You you had the SOA manifesto. Yeah, yeah. What what's that all about? Oh, uh, oh the uh, yeah the SOA manifesto. Mm -hmm. um, so the early days of service-oriented architecture, which I talked about earlier, uh, how you build, you know, uh, software like using services and now microservices uh, mm -hmm. architecture, uh, we were still evangelizing that way, right? And this is when, if you recall, the Agile Manifesto in those days mm -hmm. came out, and the Agile Manifesto was about setting the principles, what it means to build software in an Agile manner, in an Agile philosophy, right? And I think at the time. I was in Amsterdam at a conference. There was a couple of other people there, some luminaries and me. Uh, you know, there was like Grady Booch was there. It was like one of my heroes, one of my mm -hmm. idols. You know, he was there at the conference. Um, Thomas Earl, a couple of other people were there. And over beers, we kind of said, you know what? We need a manifesto for SOA. You know, we need to get, so we got together. I, I can't, I can't, I don't think I remember it was Amsterdam or Berlin or somewhere. We were at a conference in Europe. Um, so we said, we need to put a stake in the ground and say, this is, what service orientation means so we got mm -hmm. together over the next week or so and we kind of hammered it out during like breaks in the conference and and meetings and so on and and we got a whole bunch of other people that were deep in the space who happened to be at the conference you know serendipity right mm -hmm. and uh, we kind of uh, hammered it out over a week and, and and this is kind of like our document that's nailed <laughs> on the door of legacy <laughs> software development saying mm -hmm. this is how, how software should be built. Right? You know, mm -hmm. this is what it means to be so oriented. So that's kind of the story of it. And that's kind of the, 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 the principle, the fundamental principle of being service oriented, right? Oh, so that's, that's kind cool. of the story of the that's, manifesto. That's cool. I, I love the fact that, yeah. yeah. Well, I love the fact that it's at a conference where you're, you're, you're you know, with your peers and influences and, you know, you decide, hey, you know what? This is what, this is how it should go. And I mean, yeah. everything's always flexible and, and, you know, evolving and everything, but, but to actually spell it out for people and, and give them a guiding light. I think that's really, really cool. Yeah, no, it, it was great. And to me, actually, like, I know we're diverging again, but conferences are, have two major purposes. One of them, education, learning what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. And the other one is like the networking, like in between Completely. the sessions, you know, like I, that's an important piece. And that's, what happens out of the out of the networking sometimes, right? Yeah. Oh, no, completely. I, I have to look up where we were. I can't remember that anymore. I, you know, it's one of those Europe. things I have to look it up. Europe. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah, small, yeah, it's yeah. a small country. Yeah, yeah. That's my air quotes That's right. here. That's my, those exactly. my air quotes. Yeah. And you know yeah. what, you, what, what you talked out about? I mean, I love conferences too. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a couple right. in, the in the near yeah. future. Yeah. But one thing I did before COVID is I was at a conference in 
this was San Francisco and it was a lovely day and there was a bench and a tree in between the two buildings where people were coming in and I actually yeah. didn't go to any of the speakers I don't know why I just it, it wasn't really sat my thing down. I sat on the bench it was enough space for two people and I just met people all day oh and that's what God. I did awesome. and it was Love it. freaking fantastic of just like you know Love what it. they come to me it's totally you know no no backs are up it's just you know yeah it's a nice day yeah. how you doing you know it, it yeah. was it, oh, it was love great it. love it love it it love was it. great yeah no, well awesome. well i i mean i i'm part of it I'm, I'm a part of a round table um you know that <laughs> that i learn a lot from you know from my peers yeah. and all this and you know you created um, many years ago uh the cto mm -hmm. round table a local one here can you tell me a little bit about that oh yeah yeah of course um so that was a long time ago when i first moved to vancouver so 20 years ago um, I realized there was no forum at the time, you know, in 2002, 2003, there was no really forum for executive uh, tech execs, you know, and tech leaders to kind of share and bond and help each other out, right? And I had just moved up from the US where I was in, in an RTP where we had a group like that, uh, that I learned a lot from, it was very useful for me. Mm -hmm. So I started asking around, talking to people, and also for me, it was a way to get introduced into the community. I didn't know yeah. anybody, right? I just moved up here. Uh, and so I started talking to people and started hosting actually informal coffee and pastries at my office in layer seven. Um, and um, yeah, so it started from there, started growing, people started coming and it was interesting. And then Bill Bennett, who was a maxim maximizer at the time, mm -hmm. Bill said, hey, let's formalize this. So we did. And then at some point it became a little bit too big. So we kind of handed it over to the BCTIA to run it and, uh, and, and manage it and so on. And it was great. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't, I don't know the status of it now, but it was, it ran for many, many years after we handed over to BCTIA. Um, and it was great. I have, you know, I haven't followed up with it, but, but so you say you were part of a round table. I'm all, so there's another round table, you know, um, that also CTOs that I, you know, fight rules, you know, club, uh, fight club rules. I mean, you're <laughs> not, not supposed to mention it or say mm -hmm, it, but mm -hmm. you know, there's a little, because there's, you know, it's, it's sensitive, you know, we, oh, yeah. we have a couple of rules around, you know, uh, no poaching, no confidential information, everything we say stays in that. So, so it's a very different kind of aspect as opposed to the open CTO round table, mm -hmm. this one, but yeah, I find these things extremely useful, you know, uh, but you know, COVID has put a damper on a lot of these activities, unfortunately, I find, you know, so they're the not last the couple same of years, remote, are they? Yeah. Yeah, 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 they're yeah. just not the same, you know, if you can't I shake think. a hand, it's just, it's not, but with that said, you know what, we, uh, we, 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 it's a, it's a brave new world. We're moving into, we're moving in. We yeah. actually have an event at our office today with like 80 people, a Volition oh, slash Langer awesome. event. Oh, wow. Yeah, I knew. Wow. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. Excellent. Um, yeah. Well, to tell you what, I mean, the theme of afternoon tea, the whole genesis of it was to talk to wonderful founders like yourself, um, um, you know, with a Canadian perspective to talk, um, to, to, to learn from you, to, to prepare that next generation of, of founders and startups. Yeah, so of course, I always have my two questions. I'm going to ask them here. I'm really excited about your answers. So I think they're going to be great, but first uh -oh. off, can you tell, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm setting Way you up. to set me up. Chris. I'm setting you up. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nowhere you're going now. So tell you, tell you what, can you share one piece of advice to help a younger Canadian founder? Oh, one piece of advice. Um, that's very constricting, you know. Uh, Two if you got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've got a couple. So I, I, I've been to a couple of VEF, Vancouver Entrepreneur Forum, you know, the VEF <laughs> uh, events where I get asked the same question. You know, my first answer is kind of, you know, uh, not to be too flippant, but don't read business books, <laughs> you know. <laughs> They're poison, you know. They poison your mind, restrict your vision, use your instinct and common sense, you know. Um, Correlation doesn't mean causality just because it worked for this company that comes in. Anyway, so that's the flippant kind of uh, answer. But but the, the, the more real answers are like, you know, determination, but like you have to be determined. Intelligence and, and education can only take you so far, you know. Um, if you're not determined, you're going to give up at the first serious obstacle. So mm -hmm. think hard about, do you really believe in what you're doing, right? And Very if much. you really believe that your mission is, just get it done, find, find ways to do it and get it done. That's advice number one. The other mm -hmm. one, just as important, is find the right people. Completely. P I, you know, it's probably one of the most overlooked factors in success. You know, I've, I've been, I can count myself successful, knock on wood here. I'm knocking my head. <laughs> uh, it's not because I'm smarter than anybody else. Not because, you know, these exits is like I did. It's because I was very fortunate to have a huge number of support, really good people around me from, 
uh, the VCs, like we mentioned Maria Pichella earlier. Mm-hmm. Maria was like one of the smartest people I know. Uh, she is. She was a strong believer in us you know, at the beginning to the, the team that I don't. So I have people who have worked with me um, at Layer 7, that worked with me at Metaphor, that worked with me at Splunk. Like we have, I have, uh, I have this support group of people, incredible people who are, and, and with the right people, I think you can do pretty much anything that you mm-hmm. want, right? So that's kind of really, really important. So uh, determination as opposed to intelligence and education. And mm-hmm. the other one is just find the right people. I have a lot more, but, but no, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do, but you know what? Yeah. These are gold. I mean, those two points of all are, are, are gold. Uh, so I thank you for them. And, and, and you mentioned Maria, who is wonderful. And she was on one of the earlier uh, podcasts yeah, she and she yeah. actually mentioned you in this context. So I'm going to, I'm going to form the question uh, in the way. And, and you know what I'm going to say, you can't say Maria that we love her and think she's wonderful, but yeah, she, can you yeah, share the name of Canadian entrepreneurial star or founder that you personally look up to? Yes. So this is where I might get controversial. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, for me, for somebody, I, I would, I will look for people who have changed the world, who have had mm-hmm. a big impact on the world, right? Mm-hmm. Canadians. Now, depending whether you count them as Canadian or not, I consider him to be Canadian. I look at somebody like Elon Musk, you know, if you put his antics aside, you know, <laughs> you know, it's undeniable that he changed the world. Right. Completely. So completely the way the way he just took on this huge problem, you know, what? I'm going to build a car company and it's going to be an electric car company. Mm-hmm. And people are like, are you are you serious? You've never built cars before. You know what it takes to build a car? Look at GM. And Ford. Like, I don't mm-hmm. care. I want to do it. Right. That's among other things. He changed the world that way. Um, I'm going to give you another one. Like for me being an old school kind of person. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think of the early days of, of RIM, Research in Motion, you yep. know, and I look at, at like Michael Lazarides, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, BlackBerry changed the world the same kind of way, right? Yep. You know, um, and, 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 and had a huge impact. Granted, Apple came after and like improved the iPhone and changed the world again, you know. But for me, like the, the BlackBerry, especially that BlackBerry Pearl, oh my God, it was so good like was was a, a game changer and set the stage for other companies to come, you know. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot. I mean, well, we're, for a, small, for a small population country like Canada, I think we have, we punch above our weight. Completely. But if I were to pick two people in my mind that I look up to that changed the world, these are the uh, two that. And, and, and very different people, but very, you know, hugely impactful. Yeah. And I, I, I want to actually thank you for mentioning Musk because no one's ever said him. And I've always wondered why, because I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer too. I mean, he did university at least his first two years, uh, you know, yeah. here and, yeah. and, yeah. you know, he's, he's definitely, I mean, he seems to only marry Canadians. So that, that keeps him in, in, in line there too. Um, but you know, you're going to edit that part out, right? Oh no, no, no. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have that highlight and in quoted in there. Um, well, just like mom, you know, you, you, whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. but oh man, well, you know what, to, this was so much fun. And I, and I thank you for thank your you. time today. I really, really no, appreciate, appreciate you sharing it. with us and, uh, and, uh, you know, keep making big, big, solving big problems. Uh, I, cause you, I, you, you're doing a great. I, I, I have to, it's, this is what keeps me going. I love it. And, uh, thank you so much. Chris. This has been incredible. It's really, really good. I, I look up to your to your show. I, as I said, I meant I watch, I listen to your podcast on my drive back and forth to Seattle, uh, and it's been really, really an honor. Thank you well, so much. I, I, tr- I truly, I truly appreciate it. You know, and uh, thank you.